So good evening and welcome everyone to the session on converting evidence to value for you and your clients in practice, organized by Ada Health Bangladesh. This is Dr. Mijan will facilitate the discussion. Our today's speaker is Dr. Mike Steele, who is the director of, of Inspire Cattle Solutions and is a global independent dairy consultant, provides services to dairy farms, processors, and animal health companies. Mike has a wide experience on farm process practice in UK and Ireland. He was also a lecturer of farm animal science at University of Bristol and was intensively involved in teaching evidence-based veterinary medicine. Mike had also a research position at Royal Veterinary College, London. He visits many countries and can analyze farm data to ensure tangible solutions. We have also another guest speaker, Professor Sarah Belli. She is the Professor Emeritus at University of Bristol with a distinct career in academics and practice. Now, she is leading several research projects in veterinary education, and we are happy to be a part of our project. We have also distinguished panelists who will also participate in the discussion. Here, Professor Dr. Gulam Shahi Alam, he is the member of Bangladesh Accreditation Council, and also he is the former Vice Chancellor of Bangladesh Senior Agriculture University. He is one of the senior veterinarians in Bangladesh and was a professor of animal production in Bangladesh Agriculture University. He was a well known field practitioner. We have also here Professor N.C. Devnath. He is also a senior veterinarian in Bangladesh, founder, vice chancellor of Chirang Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, and coordinator of, coordinator of On Health Bangladesh. And now he is leading several international research projects. We have also Professor Dr. Abdul Samad. He is a professor of medicine and was a dean at Maharashtra Fisheries and Animal Sciences University, India. He is a distinguished field practitioner and works on a hard based approach in daily practice. He is running a project on digital monitoring on farm animals. We have also our colleague Dr. Gerrit Kope. He is an epidemiologist and academician. And Utrecht University, Netherlands. He has wide experience in mastitis and antimicrobial resistance research nationally and internationally. We have also another colleague, Dr. Ruzahan Mansur. She is teaching farm animal medicine in University Putra, Malaysia. She is also doing mastitis research. So, welcome everybody to this uh, discussion. We have also Ada, our other health member, Professor Arsenal Hawk, Dr. Dela, Dr. Shubho. So, before going to main discussion, I would like to request Professor Sara Belli to talk briefly about evidence based veterinary medicine learning project. So, please, Sara, you can talk now. Thank you. I wish I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Um. Window. Here we go. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see. Yes, we can see them. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, um, my background is I am a veterinarian, and my postgraduate qualification was actually in cattle health and production. So. I was a, a cattle practitioner for many years, but now involved in education and very fortunate to be involved with several proje projects in Bangladesh, particularly with Suvasu on accreditation, on clinical skills, ran some workshops there just 18 months ago, uh, evidence-based veterinary medicine project with Dr. Mushan and work-based learning with uh, Professor Rukan. So, I wanted to tell you a little about the evidence-based veterinary medicine projects, uh, which an international team have been doing, and that led to the collaboration with Dr. Michan and his colleagues at Sivasu and to us organizing this webinar. 
So we had uh, two grants from the charity, which is the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons uh, Knowledge, and they were to develop learning resources that would allow students and field veterinarians to learn more about EBVM and embed it in their daily practice. So the collaborators have been academics, librarians, and veterinary practitioners based all over the world. So the US, Canada, uh, the West Indies, Grenada, the UK, Germany, Romania, South Africa, and of course, Bangladesh. The online resource is called eBVM Learning. There's a screenshot of it on the bottom left, and it's free and open access. It has currently over a thousand users per month from all around the world. And it's structured as modules that take you through the what we call the five A's of eBVM. So that cycle on the right, which helps you to ask your clinical question, to, so to format it correctly. Then gives you tips on how to acquire the evidence, so the studies and the papers that you need to find to give you the evidence, then to evaluate and appraise that evidence. Then moving on to having uh, collected that evidence, how you would apply it uh, through change in your clinical workplace. And the final step is assess, where you look at the impact of that change. So we're thinking about um, the improvements that you can see for the animals, the cows, if you like, uh, for the farmers and for yourselves as veterinarians and your veterinary practice. Also, um, I wanted to let you know that the team are producing a concise version of uh, eBBM learning. Uh, the, the one that I'm showing on the screen has these, these quite detailed modules, but we're developing one for field veterinarians, and this has been informed by focus groups with practitioners in the UK and also in Bangladesh. And the good news is that should be available by the end of 2020. So that's really all I wanted to say. It's great to be here and to be part of this, and I will hand over to Mike. So I'll stop sharing my screen and let you do so, Mike. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for your uh, short talk. Now I would like to request uh, Dr. Mike to start his main presentation. Okay, thank you very, very much, Dr. Mizan. And thank you to Sarah as well and the University of Bangladesh for inviting me there. It's a great to be a part of this project. And uh, if everyone can see my screen and just confirm, that's okay. You should see a PowerPoint saying evidence-based veterinary medicine. And uh, I'll, I'll just uh, put a little bit of background to myself here. Um, thank you very much to Dr. Mizan to introduce me. I am a dairy consultant and I've worked in many countries around the world. I'm lucky enough to have traveled to all over Europe, US, Canada, uh, East Africa to do projects there, um, Pakistan, Bangladesh. I've traveled a lot seen a lot of dairies and a lot of different requirements from different places. But the one thing that I always take home is that uh, there are similarities between everybody, whether it's a person with uh, two cows that are producing three litres a day in Uganda, or somebody, a family with two and a half thousand cows in Estonia. It doesn't really matter you're still dealing with a cow in an environment and a rumen that needs to stay consistent. And if you can provide those and you can provide a nice consistent environment to the cow, then I think you're going to get most things right. But one thing we all have in common as vets across the globe is questions from our clients. We're always, and questions ourselves. So, Sorry, Hello, yes. Mike. We yes. Your presentation, please. Ah, you okay. Share? Yeah, I shall go back to um, the screen. Ah, uh, yes, I'm just not pressing the right button. I am very sorry about that. I think you'll be able to see it now. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, you weren't missing anything. It was more just me talking anyway. Um, so I do think that we all ask questions of what we do and our, our clients ask us questions all the time as well. So when we have a clinical problem in practice, we think of a question and we want to give a solution. And 
there is a process there. Now, as a vet, and from graduation, what I want to do is provide a solution all of the time. And it's very easy to be given a problem, like uh, I have too much mastitis on my farm. And immediately I'm thinking, right, okay, I want to give some antibiotics to the cows and I want to do something with the parlor that, that, to do some testing, or I want to watch the person milk the cow and find out why. Now, this is all very well and we can produce a solution, but we're still not fixing the root cause. So there's a process involved. We need a problem. We need to convert that problem to data. So we need evidence behind there. And then we need to convert data to information, to knowledge, and then a solution. And then what we're doing in each of those steps is reducing the risk of our intervention at the end, producing a negative outcome. Okay, so what we really want to do is whatever solution we give is to provide the best scientific evidence from the best data we have at our fingertips to produce an outcome that is going to be of value to the client. And evidence-based veterinary medicine and the process of it is just one of those tools that we can put into that toolbox. And it I have to say, it's been so useful to me going through all of the knowledge that we have and to provide a process to look at that evidence. So these are some notes that I've put together. I'm actually going to go in and out of this presentation because I'm going to show you some live things on the internet, uh, some useful techniques to look at, uh, to look for papers at your fingertips. Um, give a few tips on appraisal of papers and then I'm going to show you how some of that process fits into a clinical case in the first place. Okay, so to start with, with Sarah's project and evidence-based veterinary medicine, what we want to do is we want to understand that people ask us questions and we want to answer those questions. So what is evidence? And in our case, there are two real areas of evidence in dairy. One is the evidence that we have on the internet and from science and literature. Um, and the other is evidence from data. So stuff that we collect from the farm, uh, data about the cows, the milk yield, the reproduction data, all of that sort of stuff. So there are databases of data and there are databases of scientific information. And today we're going to focus a lot more on the scientific information side. So what evidence-based veterinary medicine is, is asking a scientific question and then critically appraising the papers and the literature that we get so that we can ask and create an informed opinion. And then we're going to come up with something called a clinical bottom line, which is our opinion after looking at all of the evidence of what impact that will have on the clinical question we create. Okay, so there's lots of types of evidence out there. And I think we've all met some of these people. And this is a slide from a piece of, uh, from a piece of literature on evidence-based medicine from the human side. And I love some of this. It, it, uh, we all know some of these people. So um, the, the real marker for evidence should be science, like a randomized control trial. But I think we've all met people that think that uh, their uh, bravado, so the confidence, uh, confidence is a basis for clinical decision. And that's a, a marker of bravado. And that applies only to surgeons. Yeah, I think we've all seen these people and uh, myself in practice, I was diffidence, the level of gloom. If you say that everything's going to die and it gets better, you always look slightly better. <laughs> OK, so where does the evidence come from? So we're going to look at some scientific evidence. And for that, we need to realise that there are levels of evidence. 
And there's going to be a shocker at the end of this, but we're going to start with the very top level, and that is systematic review. Now, these take months to write. They take a team of people to write. Um, and a systematic review would review all of the papers in all of history that we have. Um, they take months to write, uh, but they would give the best opinion on that clinical question. Unfortunately, though, in veterinary medicine, there are very few of these beasts. Systematic reviews are very, very rare in, in veterinary medicine. So then the next stage down is meta-analysis. And this is something that pro probably one or two authors have done by looking at several papers from a region or um, from a compacted area of time. And they've analysed those papers and put the opinions here. And that's kind of what we're doing in evidence-based veterinary medicine, in fact. What we want to do is produce a sort of mini meta-analysis that is more practical for a practitioner that's busy and out there in the field with their boots on, driving around and giving interventions to real animals. We're not all academics. So the next one is a blind, a, a randomized control trial, which is blinded. So this is when we truly have a patient population that is perfectly randomized um, everybody is blinded, so the intervention and the placebo group are blinded. The st statisticians are blinded to those groups as well, so everyone involved is blinded to the data. Again, in veterinary medicine, there are some of these, but not so many. So the next one down is a cohort study. Now, this is similar to a randomized control trial, but what we've actually done is we've chosen the patient population. And in in food animal production species, nearly all of the trials we have are actually cohort studies, not truly randomized. And this is because we've already chosen a farm to run it on, which is already, in terms of the species, that's already really reducing our numbers and choosing our patient population. So cohort studies are quite common, and it's basically uh, this group of animals were chosen uh, to give one treatment and this group of animals were chosen to give another or no treatment at all. And then you have case control studies and these are less of that. So it's more when we haven't randomized it, um, but we still have cases that are given treatments versus cases that are not. So it's still a comparison. Then you have a case series which is we gave lots of animals this treatment and we found these results. So there's usually no comparison in a case series. It's more just something, an interesting finding in many animals. And then you've got your single case report, which is we gave a llama this treatment and it got better. It's kind of interesting, but really in the big scheme of things, it's right there at the bottom of evidence. But here's the shocking thing, and this is the expert opinion, continuing professional development webinars, textbooks, colleagues are all below that in forms of levels of evidence. And I'm going to back this up slightly with a paper that was written on a group of consultants from the US. This is human consultants, medicine, and there was an evidence based intervention uh, it was to a surgical intervention on cruciate ligament repair in the knee. And they asked uh, consultants across the US their, their intervention that they would give based on a single case that was put in front of them. And sadly, less than 10% of those consultants matched with the best evidence intervention. So for that respect, many people actually base their interventions on their personal experience and not on actually looking at the evidence out there and appraising that. And sadly, that's why we have to go to evidence-based medicine and start looking elsewhere. Textbooks as well. Now, these take years to write and years often to get published. So when you take a textbook off a shelf, it's already very much out of date. 
Now, levels of evidence can be put in levels one to five in that case, or in a triangle. And, but actually, how relevant is that to my case? This is the question we need to ask. So, oh, I've got a little thing across there. So <laughs> I love this um, little uh, cartoon here. How bad is it, doctor? Should I start dating? So he has to make an opinion on this one. We've all had those kind of questions. So how are we going to answer that question to the best effect? So I don't know about you, but when I graduated, which was uh, pre-Google, so 1999, um, the clients came to me to pay for my expertise and to pay for the knowledge that I had in my head and the experience that I had. Nowadays, though, and there again, there are papers, you can go on the internet, you can look this up. There are published human clinical scientific papers um, that have done on questionnaire studies. And uh, they've asked how many patients have already Googled their condition and the intervention before they come to the consult. And the answer is actually over 80% of people do that. So our clients, our job now, Clients are paying for us, not for the knowledge that are in their head, but to guide them through the stuff that's on the internet and the misinformation that they have access to. So actually, that's more of a responsibility for our profession now than just the knowledge that is in our head and the experience that we had years ago. So where do we start? And we start by, evidence-based medicine starts by something called a PICO, which is a patient intervention comparison and outcome. So we want to generate our question to start with. So we need a patient population. In food animal medicine, it's usually a population. So uh, in our case, it's going to be dairy cows. Um, an intervention. So we might have something in mind. We might have dairy cows with mastitis an intervention that we're thinking about, perhaps it's uh, dry cow therapy, in, uh, perhaps it's teat sealants for mastitis. And then we're going to compare them with something. So are we going to compare uh, antibiotic tubes versus sealants or antibiotic tubes versus nothing or sealants versus nothing? You know, there's going to be some kind of comparison going on. And then we have the broadest one of all, and that is the outcome. And what are we actually looking for? So at the end of the day, we've got some clients, uh, uh, some cows with mastitis. And we're going to put an intervention in place. But what are we going to measure to find some value? Is that going to be, uh, is that going to be the prevalence or incidence of mastitis? Is that going to be a first service conception rate? Because that can be affected by mastitis. Are we going to look at um, the cell count? What, what, what is going to be the outcome that we're going to look for? Um, so once we know these things and we've mapped that out, we can now get our fingers ready and go on the internet and try and structure that question. So. This is what we're going to do now. So I'm actually going to go out of PowerPoint into the internet and I'm going to go to, uh, yeah, uh, here we are. Just bear, bear my poor Surface Pro in mind while it's, while it's streaming. Here we go. So a good place to go is PubMed to start with. So there are many databases out there now, this isn't the only one. Uh, if you're a part of a university, you may have a nice expensive subscription to PubMed or to uh, Science Direct or Ovid or Athens or one of those um, academic uh, library databases. Now, these are huge amounts of money a year to subscribe to. And uh, as a consultant, as a private consultant, I actually don't earn that kind of money. So I don't have access to the full papers a lot of the time. So there have to be some other places to go. And Google Scholar is another really good place to go. 
I know that some uh, some institutions don't recognize Google Scholar. Um, however, I think, in my opinion, for a veterinary uh, publication database, I think it gives you a lot of access. Um, it does give you a certain amount of filtering. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and it does give you more papers than just simply looking at PubMed and nothing else. Um, what Google Scholar doesn't do, and this is why it's frowned upon, is it doesn't publish the journals it subscribes to. Um, so we know that PubMed publishes, it looks at, say, Journal of Dairy Science and uh, Veterinary Re Record or something like that, and it subscribes to those. But Google Scholar doesn't tell you what it subscribes to. So if you don't get hits, you don't really know what it's searching. But I can tell you that from 10 years of working with it, that uh, it does have a very wide database and it does include most of those papers, often more than PubMed. OK, but we'll start with PubMed just as an example. So when you go into PubMed, this is the one that you see. Um, this is your home page. And uh, what I'm going to go do is go into advanced to start with and not just the search, because this will help the way we build our PICO. So firstly, we have a patient population. And when we enter things, you will notice that when I add something onto here, it would use something called Boolean operands. Now, I'll go through that in a minute. But first off, we need to get familiar with some of the um, internet search engine uh, shortcuts. Let's call them shortcuts. So I'm going to start with cattle because we want to look at cattle. Um, but we also want to include papers that might not say cattle. They might say cow. But they might also say cows with an S at the end. So because I want it to include cow and cows, I'm going to use a wildcard, which is a dollar sign, which is a single character that can be anything. So for instance, if I'm using antibiotic, I might use anti-dollar biotic, because then it will include papers that, that include antibiotic all as one word, or anti-space biotic, or anti-biotic. It will include all of those papers. So if I put a dollar sign in, it will include anything as a single character. Okay. Or I'm going to say Bobby star. So what this is, is if I use a star or asterisk, what it's using then is a group of characters. So this can end now in anything. So it could be bovine, bovines, bovid, bovidi, it will include any of those. So now what you can see, I'm widening that search to include papers that have cattle or cows or cow or bovine or bovid or bovidi. So it will now, those three things, will now look at everything that will include ruminants or, I don't want to include ruminants because I don't want giraffes and I don't want goats. I just want cows. OK, so I'm going to add those to the history. And uh, you'll see them appear in the query box down here. But now you can see it's using the Boolean term AND, always in capital letters. OK, so if OR widens your search, AND, and narrows it. So I'm now going to put in mastitis. And mastitis doesn't really have any other alternatives. So I'm just going to put mastitis there. Uh, then I'm going to put antibiotics. OK, now it's not just antibiotics, is it? So we're going to have an anti-dollar biotic or anti-dollar microbial because some papers might call it antibiotic, others antimicrobial. OK, and then I'm going to have dry cow therapy. Now, dry cow therapy, I don't want all the papers on PubMed that include the word dry and all the papers that include the word cow 
and all the papers that include the word therapy. What I want to do is have dry cow therapy all as one term. So I only want to look at papers that include the words dry and cow and therapy right next to each other. So I'm going to put those in square brackets. OK, so that's dry cow therapy. So now it will only include papers that have cows, mastitis, antibiotics, and dry cow therapy all in one go. And then there's our outcome. So what is our outcome going to be? And this is where we need to be specific, okay? So I'm going to put in incidence or prevalence. Okay, so I want to have some kind of inter intervention that's gonna be compared with something else um, for mastitis that's going to reduce the incidence or prevalence of mastitis. Okay, so I can search and see what comes up. Okay, so actually I'm going to clear all my filters. Great, so you can see I've got six results. Now that's not many. I'm pretty sure there's more than that out there on the internet. So I might have been too specific in my searches. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to try to search for something a little less. So let's have cow or bobby star or cattle and mastitis and dry cow therapy. Okay, so let's go searching for that. Okay, and we should have, <laughs> this is, uh, when you do things live, it never quite works out, does it? So um, I am now going to take out that and search again. We've still only got one result. What should have happened there is we should have got a lot more results. I'm not quite sure why that's not working. You can see if I take out one of these, it should go to a lot more papers. Five results. OK, so you can see that you can play around. I mean, this is live and uh, it's obviously not looking at the number of papers that I really want it to. Ah, mastitis, maybe that's my problem. Um, so it's not really looking at the number of papers that I really want it to. That's better. Right. So I had mastitis spelt wrongly. That's good learning. Um, but what you can see is now I've got way too many results, 10,283. So if I want to narrow that down, I can start using mesh filters, which are over here on the left hand side. So I can start looking at, OK, I don't want to look at books. I just want to look at reviews and systematic reviews, uh, maybe some randomized control trials. But no meta-analysis is there. Let's go for the tops of the triangle. OK, I've already got it down from 10,000 to 624. OK, so 1966, the management wasn't quite the same as it is today. I'm pretty sure we have some better management systems than 1966. So let's reduce the number of years to, say, when people could record mastitis well, like on computers, and there was good dairy software around. So let's go for the last 15 years or so. And we're down to 293, which is a bit more of a usable, usable list. OK, so now I can start to choose the ones that might be useful. And uh, I don't know, I'm just going to randomly pick a few. So let's say we chose this one, this one and this one. And we can go back up and you can see that we can have display options. So we can display by the abstract. And what's even more useful is you can save these to your own account. So I have an account up here. Bianchi Vet is, is my username. And uh, I can save that to my account. And it will save all of those nice uh, reviews on that subject to one account and one folder, which is really useful. But once I've got those papers, I now need to look at them and make sure that 
they've got some useful information in them. So now we're going to start looking at appraisal of papers. OK, so I'm going to jump back to my presentation now. And we'll go full screen. And we've asked the, gone through the PICO and database searching, so that's great. We've looked at the types of papers, so now we can go through how to look at what these things are. So if we're looking for a randomized control trial, we need to go to the method of the paper. And when we go to the method of the paper, we need to look to see, is it truly randomized? Has it been blinded? Is everyone the same? So what we need for this is to make sure that it is a randomized control trial. So were the patient groups chosen or were they randomized by computer program? Were they all of the same species? So in our case with dairy cows, were they all Holstein Friesian? Or were there some Jersey in there? Were they all in the same management system? Were they all multiparous? Or were there so, some uh, first parity animals in there too? So we need to make sure that they're comparable groups. Maybe at the same days in milk, if it was a trial, because that could affect the milk yield, certainly. Uh, then we need to make sure that the patients all underwent the instructions and they, they were all included or they excluded ones that didn't comply with the instructions of the protocol. We need to make sure that the measurements were all taken and treated objectively with decent statistics. And if we put those all together, we get a very familiar looking figure. So um, this is randomised allocation maintenance measurements, blind objective, that's Rambo. OK, so randomised control trials need to compare interventions. So we've usually got a control group and an intervention group. OK, so what we need to do is make some decision on that. So evidence-based medicine quite often uses the term called number needed to treat. So whether the paper itself deals with this um, or it doesn't, we can usually calculate that out. So what we're going to have in any paper is an event rate, which is the rate at which a bad outcome or a treatment not working by the end of the trial occurs. So this is animals still having mastitis by the end of the trial. And there's a control event rate. So this is the rate of the bad outcome in the group that were not given any treatment. So this is the number of animals that still have mastitis that were treated. And this is the number of animals that still have mastitis that weren't treated. And we need to compare those two things. So in this, you can either look at it in a relative risk reduction or an absolute risk reduction. So what I mean by this is if we have an incidence of mastitis of 19% and we reduce this to 10%, the absolute risk reduction would be 19 take away 10, which is 9% um, which is risk reduction. But what we really want to do is uh, relative risk reduction, which is uh, 19 take away 10, divided by 19, which is actually a 47% mastitis reduction. That's going to show our real value of our intervention. Or you can do the number needed to treat, which is number needed to treat is the inverse of the absolute risk reduction. OK, so if anything goes into negative figures on number needed to treat, that actually means that the treatment is worse than the control. And uh, that has a term and it's called number needed to harm in medicine. OK, now that's OK. And you'll also see p-values, um, which will say, yes, we're quite sure that mastitis went from 19 to 10. Um, and our p-value was less than 0 0.05. But then you can go and look at the number of animals in the trial and you find out that there were just five cows. Now, that's not good enough. It's a p-value is fine, but we need confidence intervals too. Now, there is a way of calculating that, uh, which is quite complicated. This is a uh, um, figure here, which is uh, quite a lot. 
But there are many solutions out there on the internet to find confidence intervals. So um, Excel has it built in. But what's important is that we then include the patient number in there. So if the trial had 2,000 cows in it, we're going to believe that result way over a trial that had, say, 35 animals in it. So we need to consider the confidence intervals too. Okay. Now, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. These also have a way of looking at trials and looking at the weighting of a trial and appraising them. And what they use is quite often is something called a forest plot. And here is a, is a publication uh, and the results of a forest plot on an intervention that's used to treat heart patients um, for heart disease. And you can see that there are, um, there are a number of years, a number of patients in each trial ranging from 77 to over three, nearly 4,000 people in that trial. And so the dot is the midpoint and the confidence intervals are these error bars either side. So you can see that this trial at the top shows almost no difference, but also had hardly any patients in it. But this trial with nearly 4,000 patients has error bars that favor treatment that actually go beyond this point of no difference. So actually it does look like it favors the treatment. But when we put all of the papers together, it looks like, yes, that treatment does favor the, yes, that's okay as a treatment group. So that's how meta-analyses put these trials together. You've got to weight the trials to the confidence intervals of those trials. Okay, so evidence-based medicine is about being able to appraise papers that you look at and do it quickly, and it's called quick and dirty. So as a practitioner, I can look on the internet and I can get that database and I can get some papers, I can read some of those papers and I can get the answer in, I wouldn't say 90 seconds, I say that's quite quick, but I can certainly get it in an hour and a half and my patient will survive and my advice will be useful. I could do it by a systematic review, but I'm gonna need a group of academics. It's gonna take me six months. And by the time I get the answer, my patient's already gonna be dead or the mastitis is gonna have ruined the, the poor farm. So evidence-based medicine is quick and dirty, but can produce value more than a systematic review if done from the beginning. Okay, so what about diagnostic tests? This is something different. If we're comparing diagnostic tests, we're not looking at patients, we're looking at test results. So for this, the absolute, the absolute minimum of data that we need is sensitivity and specificity. So is a positive true or is a negative true? And from that, you can get all of the others. So positive predictive value, negative predictive value. Again, you can go on the internet and you can look at how all of these are calculated. But you can see if you just have these four numbers, A, B, C, and D, for test positive, test negative, actually positive, actually negative, you can calculate everything else from those four numbers. So whether your trial in the results column and your paper publishes that or not, you can still calculate it because as long as they publish those four numbers. So when you appraise it, what you need to make sure is that they've done that sensitivity specificity um, test. So now you're going to put all of that together. You've maybe got uh, 20 papers, you've put them together, you've reviewed them all, you've appraised them, and you're going to make your own informed opinion. And when you do that, you call it the clinical bottom line. And this should be no more than one or two sentences. And it should say, right, OK, I've looked at all these papers. They all seem to say that dry cow therapy, if selective, is better for mastitis. So we can go towards that as my 
advice. So I'll put that down as my clinical bottom line. Okay. So when we do that though, and I've done that, I can now go to my patient or my farm and say, great, okay, we're gonna use some dry cow therapy now and we'll see what that does to the incidence. That's all well and good. But what I'm not doing is benefiting the profession by doing that as well. So if I want to benefit the profession, I can create what's called a critically appraised topic or a cat. Now, this is when you write all of that stuff down. And if you write it down and share it with people, then other people are going to have the same question. We're all dairy consultants. We're all dairy vets. We all have that question thrown at, at us on a weekly basis. So it's going to be a useful thing to share. So once we've done that search and we've done that work, what we want to do is share it. So let's write it all down on a template. And you can go to one of these. This is a really good place to look at. It's called the Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine. It's for human uh, doctors and it's based in Oxford. Um, they've got really good resources there. And now um, the site that Sarah mentioned at the start as well, which is the RCVS um, Veterinary Evidence Site um, and Knowledge Summary Site, that has this too. And it has templates for knowledge summaries on it. But ultimately, they all record your patient, your intervention, comparison outcome, um, your control event rate, your intervention event rate, good old Rambo right here, um, and your clinical bottom line at the bottom. So your template can look like anything, in fact, as long as it has all of those nice things that we can share with people. Okay. Now, I'm going to call that, when you've done it, I'm going to call it a kitten until it's a cat. And this is only my own makeup, really, because I call a kitten a cat that has not yet been reviewed. So we still need some form of, uh, of somebody else looking at that and saying, yeah, I agree with that. Some kind of peer review system. So if you're in practice, then you can have a journal club. Uh, a monthly journal club where maybe one vet in the practice a month does one of these cats. So maybe one person only has to do one every six months or so. So it's a little work to do every six months, but the practice gets the benefit every month. And you get a database within a year of a huge amount of clinical questions that you can have a lot of nice scientific evidence to back up. So a journal club a month is a really good thing to do. I used to do it myself um, I, when I worked for Elanco Animal Health. I had um, 50 consultants uh, around the globe and we used to have a Zoom meeting like this where we would review our um, cats and uh, we'd start a database going up and we did that for five years. We had a lot of really good, nice scientific evidence behind us after five years. So you can share that on, uh, if you really do write it up and get it peer reviewed, you can uh, have your own veterinary journal, online journal. There are a couple of these that exist now. Sorry, I'm just going to jump forwards a little here. Um, there is, you can follow this site here, which is veterinaryevidence.org. Um, and there are papers on there. Um, I've published on there two or three papers you can have a look at. Um, and there are Best Bets for Vets, which is done by the University of Nottingham. There are other sites starting to come as well, but globally, these are the biggest. Um, I also mentioned a little bit here, A Cat Has Nine Lives, um, and that is because every now and again, science moves on and we're gonna get more and more data. So um, for common questions, you would expect to update that cat maybe every uh, year or so. So things like mastitis are gonna have a lot of papers, um, but something really rare might have a lot fewer publishings. So you will only repeat that cat maybe once every three or four or five years, whenever the papers come up. Okay, so that completes the kind of academic side of looking at this. But what I really wanted to share with you was how I use this in practice in a clinical case.
So I'm going to give you a case that I had. And this is a farm that uh, was in Estonia. Uh, they had two, two and a half thousand cows um, and they had a problem with mastitis. And uh, it was 13% in the first lactation animals and 16% in the older animals. Um, it was costing, if you costed that up, 31 euros an animal in the herd. That's all animals. So 31 euros times 2,477 is a lot of money. So what we wanted to do is have a target of 9% in lactation one, 11% in older cows in a realistic time. So we put 12 weeks. So the background, we have uh, a two and a half thousand cow farm on TMR made of grass, silage and straw mostly. Um, there was some ability to sort um, and they're in a free stall system. So the current situation is we had poor feed access per cow um, in the dry group and the fresh group. And uh, they had some dystocia in the maternity group and there was quite a lot of stress in the first week of, of, of milking. I've watched the parlor routine um, and there were a few points that we could have some kind of uh, intervention to do in that. And we got some cell count results. Uh, they had some very good cell count results, so um, less than 100,000 in the bulk tank. Um, but the culture results were mostly Streptococcus uberis and Staphylococcus aureus. So mostly gram positive and some contagious in there as well. They had some metritis present as well. But uh, what we really did was we had to map out the root cause analysis. So when we looked at it, I always map things out in the same way. So I look at the people involved in the problem, the, the equipment, the environment, the management and the monitoring. So whether it's a problem with mastitis, uh, metritis, with milk fever, whatever you have with cows, I always look at the same five things. And when you map it out, each person has their own list of contributions to mastitis. All of the equipment has its own list of contributions. The environment has its list, the management and the monitoring has its list. And when you look back, when you've collected all of that data, you can look at it from, uh, you know, a thousand meters up. And uh, it became clear that there were two really clear things to fix. And that was overcrowding in the fresh pen and the ration sortage in the milking and dry areas. So they had two areas they really wanted to fix. Notice I haven't said about antibiotics there and it's mastitis, but their protocols were actually okay. What the problem was is these cows were stressed in the first week of calving and a lot of most of the, um, most of the cases were happening in the first seven days of milk. So it's definitely stress in the fresh cow environment. So what we did is, I'm just gonna go down to the countermeasures. So what did we do? So we have to consult the nutritionist, we have to consult the vet. We needed to do a few things in the parlor and uh, we needed to review and record the cases of mastitis. And then we build a project. Who does what by when? So the herdsmen are res uh, responsible for changing things on the farm. They do that by a certain date. The herd manager has to do things. The nutritionist has to review the, the ration. The vet has to do some training. Um, and it goes on like that. And then um, finally, we can go along and follow it up. So we can do all of that data collection and after the 12 weeks, we can follow that up, go back to the data and see what differences we made. And I can tell you now that what actually happened that after the 12 weeks, we reduced it to 8% and 9%. So it actually went beyond our targets 
Um, and that reduced it from 31 euro an animal to actually 22 euros an animal. So we saved an awful lot of money, nine euro an animal on two hundred uh, two two and a half thousand cows. So it was worth doing over, over the long run. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And that's why evidence-based medicine, by looking at evidence from data and also here's what I had to do. So how do I know that it was stress? So I had to do an evidence-based review, evidence-based medicine literature search to look at the relationships between stress and mastitis and transition cow management. And when I did that, that's when I realized that those were the things to focus on when I looked down at those countermeasures. And that's what produced some of that value in the first place. So that puts it relevant to the value we can make back to, um, back to the farm originally. So that's the thoughts that I wanted to put to you. But personally, what I want to do is just create this into a bit of a discussion. So what are your experiences? How do you think you can take some of that information and convert that into value on your farms? So thank you very much for listening. And Dr. Mizan, if you want to facilitate that, um, Okay, we've got one come in here. I'm just reading the, the chat and we've got, um, so some vets don't have prior exposure to evidence-based veterinary medicine. So what kind of strategies should you follow to motivate them to use evidence-based medicine? Now that's a really interesting question, actually. I like that. So how do you motivate people to do this in the first place? Um, Sarah would probably have a really good few views on that as well. But my own personal uh, experience of doing this, because I've done this with my own uh, vets, as I said, in Elanco, and I've done this to veterinary students at university and to um, vets in practice. So the value I put to them is, OK, we've all got these problems that we have on farms. Every week in practice, I was dealing with the same clients with the same problems in mastitis. And all of the time they were coming to me saying, well, should I use this antibiotic or should I use that, that therapy? Or what should I do? Should I uh, wipe the teats or with a uh, wet wipe or should I wash them with water? All these questions come up and you kind of give an opinion. But you only really, what you really want to know is, well, what does the science say? In that? You know, I can be backed up in this. Not only that, I've had it help me as well when some clients have had complaints and they've said, you know, the intervention you told me to do, those antibiotics you gave me, they were no good. They didn't work at all. I don't want those. And so you have to realize that interventions don't work all of the time. It's just a matter of reducing risk. And if you can show you reduce risk, whether the intervention works or not, the science can back you up that you've made the right decision in the first place. So for those reasons, I would say for peace of mind and for value to the customer, those are the motivations that I would use. But I'm perfectly uh, open to debate on this one because I think it's a really interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. So I think, uh, can I ask the panelists to ask, uh, do any comments or questions? So at the beginning, I will ask Professor uh, Guram Shahiyalam, sir, to make any comments or questions on this presentation. Sir, you are muted. You are muted, sir. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Right, right. Thank you, Mike, for your enlightening and entertaining presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank but you. Problem is this. <laughs> problem okay. is this. You know, <laughs> problem is this. The the data recording system. You know, you have been visited Bangladesh. You have a 
connection with us. They have been working with our Chittagong Vet School. Uh, you know, the how we can use the evidence based uh, veterinary medicine where there's a lacking of recording system. The farming system, socioeconomic condition, everything. You know the situation here. Though, uh, uh, how do you think that uh, without having the good recording system, how you can use this data for uh, convincing or for doing for practicing that uh, oh, well. in the country? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I I really like that question because <laughs> you're, you, you are you think it's easy to think that you are alone in that, but you yeah. are definitely not alone. OK, no. so I've come across this in many countries. I come across it in the UK as well. There are some farms that record things really well and you've got Dairy Comp 305 and some really good recording systems. And you have others that simply have a piece of paper and a pencil, you know, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and you can't yeah. beat that. You know, a piece of paper and a pencil is still evidence. It's still data. You can still record yeah. on a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, so I'm going to take you now to Uganda. OK, so I was in Uganda a few years ago and uh, there was a brilliant vet that I went round with. Uh, she had um, a region around uh, to the north of um, Kampala and she did many, many farms. She had about 150 farms on her books and none of those farms had more than, uh, I think the biggest farm was 50 cows, but most of those were one to four cows. Okay, so you can imagine the data recording would, did not exist. A lot of people were not educated enough to have even the piece of paper and the pencil, but she did, she had the education. So she could go around and she could have her book and she could write down the cases that she'd seen, the days in milk that those animals had had mastitis. Um, she could record um, for reproduction, the minimum amount you need is when the cow calved and when she was served and whether or not she was pregnant. You know, that's minimal data. They'll have that everywhere. So there are minimums that you can start with. Um, the other thing I would say is that, yes, you might think you have a lack of data, but you, most people do have one of these now. And uh, I, I'm stunned that whenever I go to Pakistan or Uganda or Kenya or anywhere, the 4G signal is better than I have sitting in the UK right now in my house. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the, the signal in the UK is often not as good as some of those countries. I mean, I was standing in the middle of uh, nowhere, literally 50 miles around. There was nothing but termite mounds and a few cows um, and some cheetah tracks. And uh, there was a better 4G signal than I have on my phone right now. You know, so some countries do that really, really well. Um, well so there there are things that you can do with very little data, yeah. Right, uh, but I, I think the, the exper clinical experience and practice is more important here in this country like us, you know? As for example, I can tell you, in my example, like, you know, if I enter in the dairy farm, and if, I, if we can see the consistency of the feces, mm -hmm. or, or you can, if I can uh, uh, smell the uh, food stuff or silage, that we can easily understand what is happening to this farm. So the clinical experience, this is an evidence with what we are getting from the farm. When I enter the in, in the farm, then we can see the consistency of the fecal sample. Then we can have uh, some bad smell or good smell from the silage or feedstock. Uh, we can easily uh, pick up the situation of the farm. And I what are the problems they are facing? You are so I think right. I think yeah. Yeah, the data system, database can back up the clinical practice to have a good conclusion. That is the one thing. The, the country like us, where the farmers even they don't have even a pension and pain. You, 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 you know the. But most of the organized farmers, they're having all little bit some data system, but still they are not uh, well aware about the uh, feeding system or the milking system or the disease control program and some blah, blah, blah. 
but vet experience better dairy practitioner they can enter the farm they can easily identify the problem that can be backed by the data or the information they have got from the farmers or the surrounding uh, neighbors and so and so so they can easily identify and solve the problem that evidence might help for this reason here in this country we are giving more emphasis on competence of the student to come up from the school so that they can identify the problem of the animal they can identify the problem of the farmer and the situation they can handle it i think this will come up slowly slowly with the good recording system and other uh, farming uh, uh, other farming system or whatever uh, uh, digital system we can introduce but that needs time to overcome this all situation but i am optimistic that the evidence based means i so I, uh, what i can say the good clinical experience and exposure to the student to the actual situation will identify the problem will help in solving the problem in the farm that's my <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah you're absolutely so, right i, mean, I think professor <laughs> samad can bear me out <laughs> yeah the, yeah, this brings up, yeah, this brings up two things, actually. So firstly, you are absolutely right. And we stand on the shoulders of giants. OK, so yeah. I know that when I go into the farm, I look at the feces and I also <laughs> am, am basing it on experience. But I'm also basing it on the papers that I've read from Sandra Godden, from Todd Duffield, from <laughs> from all of these yeah. other big people that publish that stuff. Um, mm. And uh, that's where I'm getting my opinions from. But ultimately, as well, this is down to one of the limitations of evidence-based medicine yeah. as well, yeah. is that, you know, when, it, when you get that result and you've looked at all that science, you still have to stand in front of the client and give your own opinion. Yeah. So you're basing that on your appraisal of all of that evidence and you're still using your own personal opinion on it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think it's a combination of the two. But yeah. 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 Mm. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mike. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So before before moving to Nitish sir, we have some questions. I think we can ask. There is one question, Mike. I think Sara can answer this. Sara, can you see the questions? Maybe you can. It is difficult to answer, but if you want to say something on the screen, can you see a question, Sara? Yes, we, we need EBVM website in our context to have any plans to prepare these. So the EBVM website is generic in that it is training people in EBVM with examples from dairy, uh, small animal, equine, etc. And actually the principles, so the five A's, will apply whichever area you're working in. Um, we are also producing a, a shorter version for practitioners, which will focus more on the aspects of EBVM that are easier for practitioners to learn and then apply. So it's not specifically in the context of your, it's other health, isn't it, the UHB, um, but the principles that the EBVM lab website teaches um, do apply across all species. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. We have another question. I think Mike can answer that. This is a big question. Mike, can you see the questions? Oh, yes, yes. So, this is Dr. Pasha. Hello, Dr. Pasha. Um, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Um, when do I search for evidence? Always or when you face problems or a unique case? If always, how frequently? That's a good question. How do you convince a farmer to delay the actual treatment so that you can take a second opinion or search for evidence? Ah, this is in that's interesting. I like that. Yeah. So on a practical basis, you have in your head, you have your boots on, the client in front of you, and you need to come up with an answer right now. OK, so when do I search for it? Um, the answer is, uh, I actually search probably around once a month. Uh, I do a proper search as I've just gone through that, that process with you. So I do that about once a month. And it's usually on the more interesting questions that I get. But that's only because for the last 15 years, I've been doing 
evidence-based medicine and I have that database at my fingertips. So at the beginning, I was almost doing it on a daily basis. When I got home from work, I was out there on the phone just putting in whatever I could get from the, from the papers that were out there and the questions I was getting in practice. Um, you're right. When someone's standing in front of me right then, I have to come up with an answer right then. So I will probably not look at the evidence when I'm in front of the customer. But what I will do um, is I will go back then that night and I will look on the internet and I will see what papers are out there and I will appraise them and I'll get back to them the next day. So if I've said I'll give something and I find out that there's something better or I shouldn't have done that at all, I have to lose face, but I will because I know that I'll have a better reaction in the end. So I'm prepared to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I'd rather do this instead. I've had a look and I think it's a better way to go. So by all means, come up with something. But I would always say back it up with some evidence later. Um, now, as far as do you do it for all of the problems or only in a unique case? We all know that we get some really frequent things. So there's always things like, well, what should I treat for um, endometritis? You know, that came up all the time. Should I give antibiotics or prostaglandins or both? That comes up all of the time. So that's something that you definitely need to do. Um, however, if it was something like, um, you know, oh, I've got uh, a problem with uh, low, uh, no, low numbers of neutrophils at the time of calving, that would come up much more rarely, but it's probably a root cause to many of the transition issues. So I do that one as a one-off. It's very, it's very interesting, but it affects how I think of transition management going on. So I, I, some I do frequently to the frequently asked questions, some I do less frequently, but they have more impact going forwards. Let's say that. Okay, thank you, Mike. So now I'd like to request Niti sir, if he wants to comment, make any comments or to make the questions. Sir, you can uh, talk now. Sir, it is your turn, Niti right, sir. Oh, <laughs> my network is not sometimes very well. Uh, thank you, still, you know, it is a wonderful presentation and I enjoyed it, though please be informed, I am not a clinician. I am an enthusiastic supporter of clinicians, you can rather say. And from that perspective, I do like what you have already presented with us. It is a sort of new uh, sharing in our academic community as well as our practitioner community. Uh, although I was involved with uh, uh, Sarah, to do a little bit of work uh, in this line uh, on a research project. But I wonder whether academic institutions, particularly Chittagong Veterinary and Animal Science Universities, can develop a sort of hard health program and relate those sort of things for our students. You know, they have a final year and as well as, in the final year, they all go off campus spend a lot of time uh, besides a practitioner as well as in the farms. And that sort of, uh, you know, uh, curricular exposure, uh, if uh, is given to the uh, matured student, uh, maybe that will be a better beginning. What is your opinion about that? I mean, uh, somebody being a practitioner use this knowledge is good, I like it. But from the very beginning of their uh, academic time, if they are exposed to that sort of uh, practices, even in medicine, uh, would not it be very useful and cannot be a part of the uh, curriculum of uh, undergraduate or postgraduate students? Over to you, Mike. I, th I think that question is actually music to Sarah's ears, actually, as well. <laughs> um, absolutely, I agree. Uh, in fact, uh, 
that what got me into evidence-based medicine was creating a course for undergraduates, for students. Um, so I created a course that uh, originally started for final years, but it was then expanded to start in the first year. So they knew how to search databases in the first year. They learned to um, critically appraise papers in the second year. And then from the third year on, they could apply that knowledge doing the full evidence-based medicine techniques. Um, the only thing I would say um, is, uh, for, as a teacher, um, it did make the, the students question us a lot more, which um, I actually enjoyed. I thought that was good. Uh, it's good to be, uh, it's good to be pulled up and, and actually for a student to say, hang on a second, I've looked at this and uh, what you're saying doesn't add up to, to what I've seen here. So, um, in fact, everybody learns from that. That's a really good process. Um, so I, I totally agree. It is something for students and graduates alike. Um, I also would say as well, seeing as you're not a clinician, that this technique actually comes from the aerospace industry. So it's not from medicine at all. Medicine got it from the aerospace industry. So this is how they work up problems when airplanes crash and they, they look to, to work up problems and they look at evidence and they look at what's been published and they try and back things up. So this kind of thing is done in many other areas than just clinical. Yeah. Thank you. I think... Uh, uh my colleagues. Sarah, you want to say something? Yes, I was just going to back that up, the idea of starting it as early as possible with the students, because it, it does take quite a bit of time to learn this and to build up step by step. So if you can embed it in the curriculum, you're training the future evidence-based practitioners and if it's in their course, they actually get the time to do it, because one of the most common challenges, I think, once you're a field veterinarian, is having the time to look for this stuff and to appraise it and uh, to collect the data. So for those of you who are based in, in veterinary schools and universities, if you can start to think about how you could uh, embed it in your curriculum, then I think you'll be doing the profession, the future profession, uh, a big favour, because that's definitely the easiest time to acquire these skills time is such a challenge when you're a field veterinarian speaking personally but i'm sure those of the rest of you will recognize that and it's not something you can learn quickly no and i like uh, the concept of using apps or you know the mobile and you know it is a common use of uh, technology that all young people use so efficiently far better than us and as i i mentioned to you you know most of all, all students uh, from our universities uh, spend a good amount of time uh, in the field level and they can really use that one. And if they get that exposure when they are on campus, particularly the rotation they use uh, for the clinical purposes, and they will be much more confident when they go to the field. And that is where, you know, this is one way also to expose uh, this idea with the field veterinarian as well. You know, that is how that, you know, they can learn each other. From the field veterinarian can learn from the students as well. You know, a sort of interaction uh, will be there as well. And I think we must try it. And as you said, it does not really, really, I believe that it does not require a big change of the curriculum. You know, within the uh, existing system of the rotation, uh, it can be accommodated. That's what I think. Over to you, I think that is my last comment. Thank you. It's a great conversation and discussion going on. Over. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So, Mike, there is a, there is a question on the screen. If you can uh, answer this question, hmm. please. Make yes, shortly. Dr. Taridul. So, uh, what would be the first priority to initiate evidence-based medicine at the field level? Okay, so um, so first priority, uh, I'm trying to understand the question there, but I think uh, you mean first priority to, um, so how do you start? What do you do? Um, 
at the start, what I would do is I would have a practice meeting with um, all of the vets in the practice. Uh, and I would say, right, OK, what's that? What's the most common thing we treat? Um, and then I would assign one person to go and do the, one of these critically appraised topics on that question. And then to come back after a, a couple of weeks or so when they've had time to do it. Um, and then to show people what they've done or even wait a month and wait for them to put that intervention in place in practice to show some of the value of what they've done to the farm. You know, if they've made a difference, if that animal got better, then you've got something positive to share with the rest of the vets in that practice to say, look, I looked at this. This is the intervention I did. I knew it was right. We did this and this is the difference it made. Once you show the value, that's the real key to opening the box, to open people's eyes and say, yeah, OK, I know how to do that now. I'm going to try that myself. And ultimately, that's what you want to do. You just want to motivate people to go out there and, and have a go. Oh, Dr. Mizan, I think you're on mute. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> uh, yes, there is a problem sometimes. So I'd like to request Professor Abdul Samad to make any comments or query to Mike or Sarah. If you want, sir. Sir, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself, sir. So can you please unmute yourself? I think he's looking for the button. It is on the bottom of the screen. Stop cam, mute, cam, I see. We can do by ourselves. Hello. Uh -huh. Then. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Yes. OK, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mizan, uh, for giving me this opportunity to interact. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steele, for a nice presentation. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I, I was remembering, you know, my, uh, you know, class with Wayne Martin and Alan Meek in OVC, uh, where, you know, I, I took epidemiology classes with them. And I think you know that was the first time uh, after going from India that I was exposed to you know, this part of uh, uh, you know the curriculum because till that time epidemiology was not taught in veterinary colleges here in India. And uh, believe me, you know when when I completed my first course, it was really an eye opener that you know this is something which we need to uh, you know even do in countries like india bangladesh where you know we do have uh, certain problems like uh, you know small hold uh, you know farmers are having very few animals and there are there are few difficulties you know which i encountered you know when i came back from canada after my phd i wanted to implement you know such a system over here uh, and uh, I think Dr. Shahi also you know, asked this question as to you know, how this thing can be, uh, you know, applied here uh, in 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 our you know, in, in our countries. There are two problems, Dr. Shahi, uh, you know, which I have encountered here. Uh, you know, it has been uh, almost 15 years I have been trying to implement, you know, data recording system as Dr. Uh, Dr. Steele has rightly mentioned that uh, you know, for evidence-based medicine, what, what you need as a core requirement is, is data. And data is something you know, which uh, is not available over here. And I've, I found there are, there are two issues related with it, and I'm going to be very honest with that. Because I have been you know, fighting with data recording system in India since last 15, 20 years, where even policymakers 
used to ridicule me when I used to tell them that you know we need to keep record, we need to do analysis of the record to understand and get experience from it. And they were all saying that in our system this is impossible because farmers don't have pen, they don't have pencil, and they were right. Uh, but now things have changed. I think the basic issue, you know, why generally in this part of the you know, world, uh, we are not giving much attention to data recording is because, you know, we are still continuing with curative medicine. Whereas if you, if, if, if you go through what Dr. Steele has mentioned, the whole effort of the vet in food animal practice is prevention. And then there is another factor and that is continuity in services. Whereas what we have is a discontinuous kind of service where mostly these are all you know public public veterinarians government veterinarians who are managing a hospital and you know at least you know, i'm talking you know from the you know, point of view of indian situation where you know there are hospitals and the farmer is expected to bring animal to the hospital or sometimes there is a visit and you know this veterinarian will go to the farmer attend to case come back and then afterwards, you know, there is no liability on him to find out you know, what has happened. And most of the time, farmers also do, don't keep them in bond. So these are two you know, very difficult you know, situations which uh, which we are into. And unless unless you know, we take a policy decision at the government level, that as far as food animal practice is concerned, you know, we need to go away from curative to, to preventive side. There will still be clinical cases where you know 5% 10% sickness will be there but major effort has to go to prevention and if you want to prevent a disease then the core requirement of data will be evident to the vets and i think at that point of time they'll start uh, you know recording hmm. another uh, uh, you know another another thing which i uh, took up after coming back you know from from ovc after doing my PhD, you know, over there, was you know, I also you know had an opportunity to uh, attend few you know few classes with Dr. Sackett in McMaster. You know, he is a pioneer in clinical epidemiology, and what I found in his lecture was the same principles of epidemiology can also be applied to clinical signs and symptoms. That means you know you can take a clinical sign as a diagnostic test. And you know, convert that you know with your data as a likelihood ratio, and then you know you can combine the diagnose, diagnostic laboratory test, your clinical signs, convert that into likelihood ratio, and then you know you will be able to you know get a diagnose. So I I did you know some some work on those lines, and those were all you know very fascinating kind of things you know because that increases your confidence because you are using symptoms, you are using you know diagnostic tests, combining them to find out. You know what exactly is going to be the outcome. I think these are these 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 are the things you know which are uh, which we 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 should be able to do in this part of the in this part of the, uh, the world also because we are interested in, in using less medicine so that the quality of product is good. When you are into curative mo mode, the only option with you is look at the face of the animal and give treatment, which is a drug. And that drug is going to come in you know, as a residue in milk. And that needs to be avoided. And that is the reason why slowly we need to you know, shift from curative to preventive. And that would happen once we start you know, clinical data recording. And there are two developments which are taking place. I think with that, all the vets should be able to start you know, data recording. For example, there are good apps available on your mobile. So you can use mobile and at least start, you know, electronic, your clinical case recording at least, where, you know, you can pick up symptoms, you can pick up, you know, what is the treatment you have given and keep that on a server and analyze that to find out how many cases of mastitis were treated in Bangladesh in a particular month, what were the outcome, you know, what is the days in milk, and that Dr. Steele was mentioning. So that is, you know, you know, is something very easy to do because you are i mean you know every vet is required to write a case paper and so instead of writing on the paper if you can use mobile and enter data it becomes very easy to analyze the data 
and that i think is, is you know going to be the beginning of uh, you know evidence based medicine and uh, let's uh, I, I i think you know uh, after 15 years uh, dr steel you know i'm fortunate enough to have a database of around 1 million animals cows i have i i i, you know, I have a system where all treatments are recorded recorded in real time data comes in real time we are doing analysis and giving support to the vet whenever he, it is required and once you have data even you know like dr steel first said that you know you have to identify the problem now if you have data and if you are if you are analyzing data in real time the problem can also be identified by the data itself because if you give a threshold that if it goes beyond this give me an alert so if if milk milk yield goes down by this threshold give me an alert so no, you i you also identify the problems so there are a lot of things with you know artificial intelligence you know with uh, with you know mobile with computers i think you know it should be possible uh, it should be possible here so i i must thank again dr steel for uh, giving an excellent uh, you know lecture on how to consider you know different factors you know how to consider the you know data that is available out on the internet because you know i i call it a whatsapp university here in this part of the country and you know one should know how to filter because there are so many things available on whatsapp and you know you never know what is correct and what is incorrect so therefore whatever whatever criteria dr steel has mentioned i think that we should keep in mind before accepting the evidence that is available on internet or on mobile thank you thank you very much once again for giving me this opportunity uh dr abdul thank you very much uh, as well for those comments and actually you're absolutely right again you know if the the fundamental thing with data is if you don't monitor you cannot manage and so yeah that's that's it that's the bottom line and uh you know it, it, the even the smallest amount you can collect you can create some value from that and uh yeah you're right we've all got mobile phones these days and there's usually something on there that will allow you to collect numbers and and evidence so yeah you're right even pencil and paper can still do it you know and and, and dr steel this is what i also found was people get interested in data if they start you know getting experience from it otherwise you know if you ask them to write and register they don't see a value in it because you know it becomes very difficult to go back and analyze data you know, you know from from mm -hmm. from 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 in you know, a written format yeah but, you know if you are able to you know share uh, you know the analysis of the data with them you know then they become interested because you know, they are learning from it yeah there's an interesting question popped up on the on the comments here actually and that is how do you encourage farmers to keep data Now this is a big question and there's conferences on this a whole conferences just on this one topic um so it's hard it's really hard but in again I I bring it back to value because the reason why farmers do not keep data is because they don't see the point in keeping data they haven't been shown the value by the practitioner it's the vet's fault it's my fault If a farmer doesn't record data, it's my fault, and that's because I haven't shown him that recording data is useful to him, yeah, or useful enough to do. So I'll take I'll give you one single example to finish with, okay? And that's um, I like I I went onto a farm two years ago to fix ketosis. I thought they had a problem with ketosis. so i said right you need to fix ketosis is the way i was going to approach it and then somebody it was a marketer not a vet nobody nothing to do with this said why don't you just listen to the customer in the first place so i said okay i've never done that before i've always gone onto a farm and said you've got mastitis you need to fix it you know <laughs> so okay i'll do that so i sat down with the customer with the farmer and i said um Okay, if there's a problem on your farm, if there was one thing that makes you lose sleep, what is it? And he said, "I don't have t enough time in, for my to spend with my children on a Sunday." So I said, 
okay, why aren't you spending time? And he said, well, I've got too many sick cows. I have too much stuff to do on a Sunday. I don't get time to spend with my children. So I said, wow. okay, well, why are they sick? And he said, well, they're getting mastitis, they're getting metritis, they're getting displaced abomasum, they're getting all these other things. So I said, okay, let's go and have a walk around the farm and let's have a look. Sure enough, the transition area had not enough feed access. They were Ooh. sorting fiber out of the food. Um, they had ketosis. Ketosis lowered the immune system, was a gateway to all of these other diseases. So we reduced ketosis. Um, we sorted the ration. We, in we increased the feed access. And three months later, he had no cases of ketosis. His sick pen was empty. Okay, so I said to him, you know, we fixed ketosis. We saved you this amount of money. It was 16,000 GB pounds. And um, he, he didn't bat an eyelid. He said, oh, okay. I was quite pleased, but he went, oh, all right. So I said, well, okay, how much time do you get with your kids on a Sunday? And suddenly his eyes lit up and he said, wow, you know, I got to, I got to take them on a picnic. I got to do this. I got three hours with them the other day. It's really good. That's what he saw the value in. Suddenly, he saw the value in collecting BHBA data because he could spend more time with his children because of it. That's why. Yeah. Now, as, as far as India is concerned, you know, because... Okay, thank you. Yeah, the gentleman has also asked, you know, about, you know, India, you know, what, you know, what are we doing to encourage farmers to keep data? Uh, well, what I have adopted, uh, uh, you know, the strategy here is, you know, farmers don't keep any data. They only get notifications and SMS messages based on data analysis. And the data is entered by the vets, the para vets, and it is kept on the server. So that's how it has been working very nicely. There are a few good farmers uh, who enter milk records every 15 days, you know, except that and that is also done on a mobile phone. So there is no physical uh, you know, data uh, they're keeping, but they have full access to the data. So there are some farmers you know, who, are, uh, who, who are interested, so they can, they can look at uh, the, you know, the app, you know, which is in regional language, and they can you know, very well understand with you know, graphs and other things. But but uh, you know the farmers get interested you know once they start you know getting uh, you know the, the alert messages and you know the alarms of you know few animals that are problematic and you know then they start asking even questions whenever a vet visits you know they ask you know five different types of questions you tell me you know what you know how much milk this animal has given you know when this animal is going to calf so all these questions they start asking you know, and they they understand the value of the data. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So now I will uh, give the follow to Gerrit. Gerrit Kof. So you can make any comments or then you can ask any question. Thank you, Gerrit. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for organizing this. And thanks, uh, Mike and Sarah, for uh, an excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Very good examples and a uh, very convincing uh, story in general. So thanks a lot. Uh, and. Uh, uh, appreciate that. So one th one thing that I uh, encounter, which is I think uh, a problem across the world, is that if you look for evidence uh, in veterinary medicine, there is just not nearly as as much evidence as there is in in human medicine. And then if you make it more specific, if you want to have evidence that really applies to the situation where you are, uh, well, in my case, in the Netherlands, uh, but but even uh, a lot more uh, pregnant, uh, pregnant uh, uh, more, you know, more, more problematic in, in countries like Bangladesh. Um, you, you can find evidence for the particular disease that you are interested in, in the people that you are uh, working with, but not necessarily in the context where they are kept. And I think that really has uh, an effect on, on how applicable that data can be that you, uh, that you find. And that those results from the literature. So, so how do we go about that? How do we deal with the fact that there is so limited, such a limited amount of literature in the first place, and and especially 
a limited amount of literature that is really pertinent to the area where you are located and the, the husbandry setting and all of that, the, the, the uh, breeds that you work with and so on. How do you deal with that? Is, is that something you could you could talk yeah, about that's, that is a good question, actually. It's a really good question um, because actually veterinary medicine does have a real lack of data um, and a lack of published papers, um, especially when it comes to regional and, as you say, species specific. I mean, uh, you can even just go to jerseys like Channel Island breeds as opposed to Holstein and you've immediately cut your papers right down. You know, so um, if you go to Sahiwal or, or, you know, one of the indigenous breeds, then you really are, well, there's nothing, you know, there's hardly anything. So you're right, there is a lack of data. Um, there's not a lot we can do about that right now, but the more people that build evidence-based databases, the more gaps we can find and the more specific veterinary research we can advise in the future. And I do believe that should be a driver. So something like this RCVS knowledge base that they're getting in London now, um, what they should be doing is at the end of each of those, and they do actually, at the end of each of those templates, they say suggestions for the future. And so at the end of your cat, you should say, right, okay, well, I didn't find this, but from practice, I think this is what we should do research on. Now, research is usually driven in history. Research has been driven by academic drive. But I think in future, we should be based on what customers ask us for. We should be doing research based on what people actually ask for. I think that's... So you're right. There is a lack of evidence. There's not a lot we can do when there is a lack of evidence other than just say, well, you know, there isn't anything out there yet. But let's try and do something to find out. Create databases to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much, Mike and uh, Gary. Yeah. So there is a question on the screen. Can you comment on that? Yes, yes. So uh, based on evidence, we need to prepare country specific or herd specific health management and treatment guidelines. This is going along same same lines as Harriet was was talking about, actually. Um, so herd specific and treatment guidelines. I think this is where evidence-based medicine does come to the fore because when you start putting in herd treatment guidelines, then you're talking about standard operating procedures. And in a standard operating procedure, you want to base that on the best evidence that's out there. So this is a really good use of your evidence-based medicine techniques. So if I'm making standard operating procedures on say drying off cows, I want to know, okay, what's the best thing to dry them off with? Should I use a teat sealant? What's that going to do in terms of incidence of mastitis and cell counts when I get to the other end of lactation? Um, what's that going to do to milk yields? What does the evidence say about that? There's all those questions that suddenly come up. And if I want to do a dry cow procedure, drying off procedure, I want to base it on the best evidence that's out there. So I'm maybe going to use 10 cats to produce one standard operating procedure on drying off cows. Yeah, so I think absolutely we need herd specific guidelines and we need to use evidence-based medicine on, on the back of that. Um, another question's come up there that actually we can tick off on that. And that's how do we relate animal welfare to it? Well, anything that reduces disease and helps to improve prevention, as Dr. Abdul was saying so well, you know, if we can prevent things, then we are automatically improving welfare. You know, if we're improving efficiencies, not only are we improving welfare, there's always been a conflict between welfare and profitability, I think. But here we can show where it can actually come together and bring everything together. Because if we're reducing disease, if we're making standard operating procedures that can produce better milk, then we're actually not only improving welfare, we're improving profitability too. So we have one more question that's come in, and that's um, 
do I have any self-made strategy to practice EBVM in practice? Now, I think, I think I'm interpreting that to say that that um, implies to the template that I put. So, yes, I do have a self-made strategy, and that is um, just listening to the client, listening to the questions that come up, the, the frequently asked questions, and then applying that PICO, critically appraise, clinical bottom line, collecting the value of that evidence at the end. So that's, that's my self-made strategy, I think. <laughs> now we're getting to bird specifics. Okay, there's yeah, one more question come up, and that's um, affected mastitis and babesiosis in the same time. Okay, I'm yeah. going to take a guess at this, um, and this is uh, this is based on a whole load of evidence that I've looked at before, and this is that um, if you look at Marcus Curley's work, if you look at uh, Jim Roth's work, if you look at Sandra Godden's work, Todd Duffield, Stephen LeBlanc, all of these people have looked at um, transition management and immune suppression. So it's pretty obvious that at the time of calving, when you have a calf inside you or a baby inside you as a mammal, um, the immune system is switched to suppress because the calf is a foreign object. The baby is a foreign object. So your immune suppression, uh, suppression is there to suppress the immune system attacking the foreign object. As soon as birth occurs, then what you want to do is suddenly you've got all of this foreign material in the uterus that you want to get rid of. So you want to switch from repair and suppress to kill, find and kill. And that's a totally different switch around for the immune system. And that's what's happening there. So I think when you see mastitis, babesiosis, metritis, um, and other disease situations that are happening, you see nearly all of them happen in the first 30 days in milk. And actually 70% of those in the first 10 days in milk. And that's because of this transition immune suppression switching. So I think that's why you're seeing them together. Um, and can I teach the students about the latest data when those are contradictory for good or to some extent to the existing book data? Yeah, yeah, I think there are many situations, like I said, when textbooks are dated. Textbooks are dated and sometimes we just have to accept that we lose face and we question the textbook. So um, if the evidence from if I look at the a Journal of Dairy Science article and it's used uh, 100,000 carving records to get this data, I'm going to start questioning the textbook if it says something else. And that's absolutely right to do. It's not a bad thing. Okay, thank you. So I think we have to finish. It is going to be two hours. So now, Sarah, before going to make uh, uh, comments, uh, conclusion, sir, do you want to say something? Hello, Sarah. Oh, Sarah. No, sorry. sorry. Um, no, I, I don't have anything to add to the discussion other than I think it's been a really excellent discussion. Um, and thank you to our panel and particularly to, to Mike, who I've known for probably about 15 years, I think. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. And it's we've been on this evidence-based veterinary medicine journey, uh, like the like you are on. Um, I was a practitioner many years ago, and we started with paper and pencils, and finding enthusiastic farmers who would start writing things down. Um, and we worked as a practice team to work with them to share good practice. And it's it's come a long way since then. And uh, the tools out there and the knowledge we have um, help us all move forward, I think. So thank you to Dr. Mishan for, for organizing this and Dr. Mike um, for presenting and all our panel members. And it's good to see okay. my colleagues in Bangladesh. 
Lovely. I'll okay, say thank that. You. And I'll also say thank you to everyone for listening. And uh, thank you to Dr. Mizan for organising all of this. It's, it's been really good. It's, it's the best debate I've ever had after after a um, lecture that I've given. It's brilliant. It's been really good discussion. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. At this, moment, at this point, I would ask uh, request Professor Arsenal Hawk to make a conclusion. Professor Arsenal Hawk. Okay, Mijan, uh, uh, it has been a wonderful session, I think, with so useful presentation and uh, stimulating discussion and question and answer. Uh, what we learned that uh, from this discussion uh, that uh, the evidences are much important in making any decisions uh, or intervention, but uh, but we are far away from from using that. So, so I think so we need to think about uh, how to make a culture uh, to use uh, the evidence medicine in veterinary science. Uh, what I get, uh, you know, that uh, the pulse from from the discussion that as we need to you know introduce uh, EVM. Uh, at uh, early stages, like you know, that uh, during university uh, stages, so that you know that they learn about, uh, and then when they will go out to the field, uh, they can feel comfortable to use it. So that is that is the message from me, and I think uh, uh, that is the nutshells uh, I received from from the discussion today. So thank you so much, Mike and uh, uh, panelists, uh, for your uh, nice participation. Also, thanks to those who are uh, following uh, our sessions uh, through uh, the Facebook uh, live and then YouTube as well. And thank you, our team. Uh, it is wonderful and we'll keep uh, communicating with uh, our panelists and our guests. Uh, hopefully, I think uh, we'll, we'll be able to introduce our PBL, particularly I have a specific suggestion that uh, we can introduce PBL uh, during our internship period. Uh, that is a loop and uh, we can find out the slot uh, and but, but need some some kind of discussion. I think we'll do that. I mean, in future. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, we should uh, close today because it is uh, two hours. So thank you everybody for uh, joining our contribution. And uh, Shyam Sir, Nitish Sir, Gerit, and uh, Professor Sar and Mike, and uh, Professor Asmal. Thank you very much. See you next thank time. You. Thank you. Mike. Bye, bye, bye. 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 Bye.